Today, I'm speaking with Tara Banks. Tara, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Tim. And I just want to give a brief bio for Tara. Tara is a former massage therapist, and she's currently a stay-at-home mom to two small kids. And how old are your kids? Mm -hmm. uh, my kids are two and four. Nice. So you're busy. And I have a <laughs> similar situation. And you're a health coach. And what does Ayurvedic specialist mean? Ayurvedic specialist is a sister science of yoga. Um, it focuses on health and nutrition and just a healthy lifestyle in general. Okay. Very cool. And you're a yoga teacher. Um, and you're originally from Tennessee. Uh, you we were in Boston when I think we first connected, but you just moved to Louisville, Kentucky. How's your time there been so far? Well, we've only spent a week so far in Louisville and I love it. It's, it's really nice. It reminds me of home a lot. That's awesome. Um, it's, yeah, I'm excited to be here. <laughs> what part of Tennessee did you grow up in? Knoxville. Well, okay. a little city probably southwest of Knoxville called Rockwood. Very nice. And that's yeah. what I know about you so far in terms of the big picture. But um, do you have any uh, other hobbies or any interests you'd like to share for part of the bio? Um, hobbies? I haven't really been able to do many of my hobbies since I've had kids. <laughs> of course, they keep me very, very busy, especially my two-year-old. He's very uh, spirited, I'll say. Um, I really enjoy reading books when I have time. Um, I'm always reading at least three books. <laughs> Um, I like to knit and crochet and I was really into jewelry making before I had kids, but I hope to pick that up again someday soon. <laughs> Fun. Very cool. And I, I love to start by just asking people to give us a little bit of a background of your story. Um, and what was it like growing up in terms of, uh, your, you know, your, your religious upbringing, what were you told about God and the Bible and how to be right with Jesus or just what was, what were your earliest memories? Um, so when I was born, my mom was a Methodist and my dad was not religious at all. Um, and you know, we went to church on Sundays, of course, just me and my mom. Sometimes my dad would come just, you know, just to say he did, um, probably just more to socialize and to really listen to the preaching. Um, and I loved it when my dad came because he was a fun parent. I didn't have to pay attention to the pastor. He would talk to me and play games with me. And it was a lot of fun. When my mom, it was just me and my mom, we, um, you know, I had to sit like this. I had to have my hands folded. I had to look at the pastor. I couldn't, you know, move around and play. Um, it, overall, Methodist wasn't too bad. Um, I went to Sunday school, um, which was fun. My teacher was pretty cool. Um, but when I got to the age of kindergarten um, and I had to go to school, um, my mom and my dad did not want me to go to the public school in town because there, there was a drug problem. Um, so the only other option was an independent Baptist church school two towns over. Mm. Um, so they signed me up for that. And <laughs> was it like a church I, school where you went to the church and the school together? So at the time, my mom was also kind of had a falling out with the Methodist that um, they were starting to be okay with gay people coming into their congregation, heaven forbid. And the worst thing of all was they were allowing women to be pastors, which is a huge, you know, upset <laughs> for fundamentalists because women, you know, should not be in places of power. Um, so they were looking for another church. My mom was looking for another church because she started to feel uncomfortable with all the changes. So we decided to go to church there. And I started church there a few months before I started school there. And when I started school there, I was there six out of seven days of the week. Um, so my whole life revolved around this place. What would you, what were those, some of those six out of seven days a week events? Was it like Bible studies or prayer meetings? Well, the, the five days of the week was school. So it was kindergarten. Okay, and then sure. I was there from age five to 18. So it was school, if you could call it that. Um, <laughs> we didn't really learn very much as far as school goes. but um, And then the sixth day was, was church. Um, so How long did you say you went there? To, to what age? 18, until I graduated high school. From starting at age five? Mm-hmm. You were at an independent Baptist school from five to 18? Yes. Wow. Yes. 
that somehow I made opens it out. up a whole bunch of questions that I can ask. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> very interesting. And I, and I'll just say I'm I'm very sorry. <laughs> oh, it's it's okay. I I really see now that I'm away from it how it made me into the person that I am today. And I mean, you know, as far as I I go personally, I am grateful for that because I wouldn't have you know the worldview that I do now. I wouldn't be who I am so looking back on it it was terrible when I was going through it but looking back on it you know for me it, it, it was fine and I ended up okay but going back to the beginning um kindergarten was okay because I was only there half a day for the first year and my teacher was really cool and even though you know I say it was okay they did tell us about hell and the rapture and all the horrible things that happen if you don't get um, called up by Jesus um, after the rapture happened. Um, and they did even talk like in about, kindergarten age. Yes. Yes. Wow. From a very young age, they wanted to scare you so bad that you would get saved. Like, that was their tactic. They wanted to scare you and, and it worked. I mean, hmm. <laughs> I mean, it, it really is traumatic when you're five years old to hear about hell being burned alive and worms eating you and, and very graphic about, you know, demons torturing you and, and, and you're five years old, who tells a five-year-old that? I mean, I cannot imagine my kid, uh, my oldest kid just turned four today, actually. And I would never tell him anything like that. Um, <laughs> looking back on that, it's just not right. Um, so yeah, like I told you once before, um, other kids, you know, at public schools were playing together and having fun. And I was worried about what it felt like having your head cut off because, you know, that was a very real danger for me since I wasn't saved. Um, you know, Christians or believers after the rapture, if you get saved after the rapture takes place, you'll have your head cut off. And they were very adamant that we knew that and you know five years old I'm wondering what it feels like to have your head cut off um just the psychological damage that that causes a five-year-old is 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 horrible um can I just um so, ask a clarification question you mentioned the word rapture and and I, mm -hmm. I think you said the word tribulation or at least it came into my mind um what for anyone that doesn't know what that is or refers to what was your understanding of what they were trying to say with that what what do those words mean Okay, so during end time, Jesus will come back to earth and everyone that already is saved or already um, <clears throat> has, you know, believes in him will be called up and they'll meet him in the sky and they'll go to heaven. And all the people that are left behind are, <laughs> I don't know if I can say that word on for show or not, but they're yeah. in trouble. <laughs> So if you, yeah, you realize can speak, that you, you can were, use whatever language comes to mind, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to, yeah, I was going to say you're fucked, right? <laughs> Pretty much. If you get left behind, you are fucked. So if you realize that you were wrong and you decide to get saved, then, you know, the government or the powers that be will arrest you and eventually you will... I don't know if this is in the Bible or if this is just something that they made up, but you'll have your head cut off. That's what they always said. Hmm. So that was like the choice of execution, I guess. Um, so the tribulation is just, um, is it seven years? I think like so, yeah. Seven years of just hell on earth, pretty much. Um, yeah. The Bible, you know, Revelation gives a very detailed description of it but i i guess i've kind of blocked it out <laughs> i don't really remember all the details but you know wars rumors of wars um people dying plagues um hell on earth pretty much yeah um, that... and if you believe in jesus after he's come back then it's even worse for you um hmm. that's all that i really remember so they're, the tribulation. they're really pushing the idea of it's there's a time limit here. Like if, if you're too late, mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like that, that parable of where um, there's the, the, the man that's getting married to, I think it was 10 or 12 virgins. 
and some of them didn't have enough oil for their lamps and some of them did and so finally when the when the groom comes the the virgins that are going to be his you know his wives or whatever harem they've got enough oil so they're able to go you know into the house or whatever and the the ladies that didn't have prepared they weren't prepared they went and got their oil you know at the town at the last minute they came back and they tried to get in and he said sorry you know the the wedding already happened it's it's over you know you, you're too late and it's like this idea of you're you have to be prepared you know and i remember myself growing up listening to a song i forget for whatever reason the um the author but talking about i think it was dc talk but i think they were actually singing someone else's song but it says we i wish we'd all been ready it might have been steve green um or maybe keith green i'm sorry but one of those old, older songs but you know i wish we'd all been ready i wish we'd all mm -hmm been ready but the, the unfortunate reality is there is a time limit and if you if you don't get in under that it's like almost makes me think of like a submarine where if some of it gets breached and the water's coming in they have to save you know the majority of the submarine so they're going to shut this bulkhead door and i'm sorry but if you're on the wrong side of it they have to shut it or the water's going to you know smother everybody so if you're on it it's too late the, the door has to go down it has to stay down and yeah. you are, as you mentioned, you know, it's, 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 it's too late. It's, it's too late. You're, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. And that puts that fear factor in you though. Of like, look, if you don't, if you don't make a decision for Christ right now, mm -hmm. you are literally in the worst danger imaginable. Yeah. Because you never knew when Jesus was going to come back. You never knew it could be, you know, right now, it could be 10 years from now. It could be tomorrow. It could be a thousand years from now. We don't know. Um, and they always match up current events with the book of Revelation. Like whatever is going on is definitely in the book of Revelation. And we are always living in end times. I think that one of the yep. apostles in the Bible even was convinced, was it Paul? I don't know. He was even convinced that he was like living in the end time. And he matched up current events with the book of Revelation. And that was thousands of years ago. Yep. Um, and they're still doing it. I mean, that's how they prove to you or they think they're proving to you that we are, in fact, living in the end times. And that makes it even more imminent that you get right with God right now. Otherwise, you could, you know, be left behind or you could go to hell, heaven forbid. Um, and once you get into hell, there's no getting out ever. Eternity. Um, and they were very descriptive of all of the tortures that happened in hell, um, the fires that are so hot, we can't even imagine, you know, it's even hotter than burning your hand in the fireplace or on a candle or the stove, which I've done. Um, <laughs> so, you know, this unfathomable heat and worms and insects eating at you and demons torturing you. I mean, it's enough to make anyone just break. Um, so by the time I was seven years old, I was constantly having just nightmare after nightmare after nightmare where I did not want to, want to go to sleep. I was afraid of going to bed and going to sleep because I could die in the middle of the night. Jesus could come back in the middle of the night. I couldn't rest. That was their goal. They wanted to make you so scared that you couldn't sleep unless you got right with God. Hmm. So by the time I was seven, I had had enough. So I told my mom, I need to get saved. And she obviously was ecstatic about it. So was my dad. I forgot to mention that my dad, when we started going to this independent church, he eventually started coming to church with us because he thought that was the right thing to do. And he eventually got saved as well. And he completely changed personalities. He wasn't like the fun dad anymore he um was really a lot more strict he was still pretty fun i mean he's a pretty cool dude but um he burned he was really into rock and roll music he took all of his records like he had original like elton john records um, he has all original beatles records like the actual records <laughs> not just the, you know, the tapes or cds or whatever um, and he took them out in the backyard and burned all of them because he was convinced mm. that rock music was satanic somehow. Um, that sounds so, like a very Baptist thing to uh, impress yeah. on your <laughs> congregants. Can I go back a second to a couple things? You mentioned hell um, and that, you know, all the ways that they would describe it to you very literally and, and horrifically. 
the rapture as well came into the picture. Did you ever get shown videos of, I guess not as much the hell, but more the rapture or the left behind stuff? Um, some of them, the older ones were stuff like the thief in the night, uh, mm -hmm. a thief in the night. And then of course there's some newer ones with, uh, I think Kurt Cameron about being left behind with the Tim LaHaye, you know, uh, Jerry Jenkins series. But did you ever see those videos where they actually tried to kind of visually scare you? Oh yeah, definitely. We watched a thief in the night um many times i actually blocked that out um hmm. one of your your interviews i believe it was with um summer summer Biden. um yeah she was talking about that video and i've heard other people on your past interviews speak about it too and i didn't remember and i looked it up and oh my goodness this like flood of memories came back to me i remember that movie so well and like I completely blocked it out. I haven't thought about it in years. And yeah, um, we watched that. And I read the Left Behind book personally, but our school slash church did not endorse it because it was too mainstream. Um, they're very old fashioned. And if anything is like modern or contemporary or mainstream, they disown it. So they, I mean, you know, they let us talk about it personally and privately, but they didn't have us read it or watch yeah. the movies. I believe Nicolas Cage, did he not do a, a movie as well about? Yeah, I think they tried to salvage yeah. the, the earlier attempts, yeah. Yeah. With, with that background, could I ask just for your, I think we'll dive into this later in, in more detail, but just for now, since we're kind of touching on it, this idea of let's get the kids while they're young before you have any access to additional information. Uh, certainly, you know, you're, you're not being exposed to multiple religions where people could right. say, well, you believe that, I believe this. And, you know, we, we may both have some good things to share. It's just, this is, this is it. Um, mm -hmm. And then the idea of you're, you're so young, you're not, you're not even like, you're, you're sheltered, but you're not a sheltered, you know, 15 year old, you're, you're a sheltered, you know, kindergartner first yeah. grader, second grader, what goes through your mind when you, when you think about them, they're not just like doing it and, and because it's just cultural. They're, they're, it's, it seems like from my, and this is my perspective on it, that they're aggressively aware that they need to get people while they're young, while they're yeah. hyper impressionable and hyper moldable. What goes through your mind when you think about that? What goes through my mind now as an adult? Yeah, like when you look at it and see it and you, and you you think this is happening currently, you know, it's, it's, we're interviewing here Sunday morning. There are kids in church right now going yeah. through what you went through before. Yeah. It makes me really sad. Um, I mean, they're being brainwashed is what it is. They're being brainwashed. Um, it's all for nothing too, because even what you say, it's mythology. It's not real. It's fabrication. Um, people use religion to control people and you know when you get a five-year-old and you tell them that this is or younger even I mean I was born into a pretty religious family um they just weren't you know with the independent church so I already knew a lot about God and the Bible and stuff before I started school but even more about it since I went to a Christian school when I was five so you know, I was being told about God and Jesus and the Bible being ultimate reality when I was born. I mean, that was my earliest memories. Um, so I thought that that was reality, actual reality. I thought that God existed, that heaven existed, that hell existed. I honestly thought that that was the truth. Even when I was younger, though, it felt off for me. It didn't resonate with me. I always felt like something was not quite right with what I was being taught. So I don't think that I ever like blindly believed in it. But I thought that that was what reality was, because I wasn't exposed to any alternatives. Hmm. Um, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I knew something was off, but I thought it was me. Because that was reality. And I just felt like I was constantly trying to, um, I felt like I was constantly trying to convince myself of something that I knew wasn't right and wasn't true. Hmm. Um, Did you see that as like a sinful 
mindset in yourself that you needed to work on getting rid of? Yeah, I thought that I was the problem because, you know, according to every other person out there, I was the problem. Um, because they tell you that God, I don't know if you know this first or not, but God views sinners or humanity in general as filthy rags. And um, that's actually a verse where he compares people to filthy rags. Yep. And you're just this disgusting thing, not even, you know, human. Like, how dare you even call yourself a human? Because you're a disgusting thing that, you know, God made. <laughs> even, I, I, I don't know, understand that part. Yeah. Even though God created us in his own image, we are still filthy and disgusting and we're nothing without God. So, you know, what does that do for your self-image, your, your, um, your self-worth? Like kids aren't growing up with any kind of self-worth when they come from that environment because they're told from the time that they were born that God hates them and that you're a disgusting sinner who deserves to go to hell. Um, and that, that takes people's power away from them. They think that they're powerless, disgusting, you know, things and that they're not worthy of anything. And maybe God, hopefully God will, you know, love me and spare me. But hmm. I, it's, it's really sad because it's really psychologically scarring, um, yeah. for kids. Yeah. That's. It makes me really sad, especially now that I have kids. It's brought a lot of things back up that I thought that I had gotten past. I mean, I couldn't imagine, like I said before, imagine bringing my four-year-old to a church where people are telling him this. My little boys are perfect. You know, I love them. They're just these amazing, um, amazing little humans, and they're perfect. And you can't convince me that they're not perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's That's sad. Awesome. It, it, Sad. It is. Now, I, I wanted to step back for one more clarification, then I'll take us forward to another question about where you left off in your story. But um, we mentioned the Bible a couple times. Just for anyone that isn't aware of the context, and I, I would have probably said I grew up in the same context as you in terms of what we believed about the Bible, but what was the importance of the Bible in terms of um, like what was it? Did it have any mistakes in it? And what was your were you allowed to look for any kind of truth outside of it or, or how would you have, how would you have categorized it as, you know, those first few years of, of your life? So the Bible is considered the God's word that he left us. Um, it's God's inherent word and we should never question it. We should never look to any other outside sources on how to live or what's right or what's wrong, unless it was written by, you know, a man who, it is a believer. Um, it was uh, not to be questioned. And that was reality. Like if it wasn't in the Bible, it was wrong. Um, hmm. And our whole life revolved around the Bible. And, you know, it was a guide for living, too. Um, I came from, you know, a very fundamentalist viewpoint and fundamentalists do believe that the bible is god's inherent word and that you shouldn't question it and you should live by every single word of it and you know if you question it if you even so much as question what the bible says there's a chance that you're not really a christian and you're going to hell um we were not allowed to ask questions about the bible in school that's something that we could have gotten into a lot of trouble over. We could have gotten a detention or if it was, um, you know, something that happens all the time. Like if we were always questioning the Bible in front of other people, especially, we probably would have gotten expelled eventually. Hmm. Um, like questioning why it said certain things and yeah, agree even, with them. Yeah. Even like, wondering why it says certain things like I never questioned anything in school but to my mom I asked her a couple of questions and oh my goodness I would I never asked her another question um, I asked her a question about the um, creation story um, in Genesis if you look at it really closely it appears that there are two different stories of creation especially when it comes to humans so the first story goes, and correct me if I'm wrong, because it's been years since I've read this, 
But the first story, God created man and woman in his own image at the same time. God created man, God created woman equally. And was that the the story where he created them out of the dust of the ground or something like that? He created them to be equal. And then you have this other story, if you read it carefully, where God created man or Adam. And then, you know, he was lonely. So God felt sorry for him and he put him to sleep and he took his rib out and he created woman, women, um, Eve from Adam's rib to be inferior to him, to help him, but not be equal to him in any way. So I was confused when I read Genesis for myself for the first time. And I asked my mom for clarification and she just immediately snapped at me. Why are you questioning the Bible? We do not question the Bible. She got really upset. She started crying. She, (laughs) I just asked a question and she just let loose at me for no reason. And I just wanted to know, she got so defensive and You know, every time you ask a question, it's the same thing. People get mad at you. They tell you that you shouldn't question. They never give you any kind of real actual answer. Like later, I um, read about um, some mythologies say that Lilith was the first woman to be created. And that when Adam tried to make her inferior to him, she said, hell no, and left. And then God went back and created Eve to be inferior to Adam. So, Mm. you know, that was a pretty cool story, I thought. But, you know, no Christian's going to tell you that. um, It's funny, too, talking about Eden um, and just the whole genesis of it all. But mm -hmm. when when you're in it, of course, you don't think what I'm about to say. But when you're out of it, you realize, like, what a crazy story, if you think about it, is like, if these people were brand new, then they're they're kind of mentally, emotionally, spiritually like children, like infants in the garden, if that was, yeah. if it had been true. And so God, knowing that this, this serpent is like the enemy of their souls and then some, that he wants to destroy not just Adam and Eve, but all of humanity and fight against God, why would you let him loose in the garden? And more importantly, if if you're willing to kill your own son eventually, why won't you be willing to kill your enemy first? Right. You know, like like kill Satan first, and then if it still isn't working, maybe as a backup plan you could kill your son, but kill your enemy first for sure. Um, you know, if God knows everything, why would He let this happen? And it, I know Christians, you know, have answers for everything, but well, they it, think they do. <laughs> they think they do, but it's like it doesn't make any sense. And like you said too, there's right. there's clearly multiple stories. There's multiple names of God. And what what amazes me too is when you look at the, when you just step outside of the biblical canon, and it's interesting that there's multiple canons. Um, mm-hmm. And like the Ethiopian church, they've never lost the book of Enoch ever. They've always had mm-hmm. it. But when you look at the the way that they keep on blaming women, it really, and this is the yeah. side note, I don't want to get too far off this, but, you know, they're blaming women for starting this sin issue. You know, Eve was... Uh, first one she was in the transgression and then she she you know incited adam to also rebel but when you look at the enochian story which is a much bigger broader picture of that time um it says that are you familiar with enoch by the way not really not the book of enoch i know what it is but i've never read it well basically and there's there's a lot in there so i'm I'm picking a little piece of it but it's this idea that the the way that the sin issue was not as much about Adam and Eve in the garden. The sin issue was that there were these fallen angels called the Watchers, and the mm-hmm. Watchers had all been in, they'd been too tempted by by human women, and they had come down and had children with them, and they ta- and in the midst of doing this, they taught the women and all of humanity a bunch of bad things that basically God didn't want them to know. Kind of similar to mm-hmm. the whole thing with um you know greek mythology where the god didn't want them to have fire but someone snuck it in and they were eventually humans had fire and then the god mm-hmm. was angry that well you know i didn't want you to have fire this is this is not good the watchers had both created these you know the giants the the nephilim and so forth mm-hmm. with these people but they'd also taught them stuff and again the women are blamed for being too you know temptresses or whatever that even the very bad angels couldn't resist them and 
any way you slice this, and, and there, there's an argument that could be made that that worldview about the Watchers and the Giants was actually much, much more prevalent of an issue than the whole Adam and Eve in the garden issue. But either story, whichever way you look at it, women are the issue over and over and over. And I just have to ask, now that you know, you know that it's mythology and you're out, does it not break your heart to think what they're teaching women, including what you talked about, like you're, you're designed as an afterthought you know, God kind of went to Adam and said, hey, pick pick, pick one of the animals as your partner. And it says he couldn't find any suitable helper. So then God made Eve like, all right, fine. If, if we have to do this, you can't get along with everybody else. You know, you can't, can't deal with it that there's all these wonderful animals to pick from. Fine, I'll make you a, a female human. And she's like this afterthought made from him, not from equally from the dust. And it says she's there as a helper. Um, yeah. And not, not as you said, an equal. Growing up as a woman, what does that do to you? Yeah, so I was taught from a very young age that women are inferior and our greatest aspiration in life should be to get married, have kids, and run the household. Um, that's all that we are allowed to do. Uh, we could have an education, but it definitely wasn't um, something that they went out of their way to have us do. Um, we can have an education and have a job, but when we have kids, we stop and we stay at home and take care of them. And we serve them and our husbands and God. Um, we aren't allowed to have positions of power, especially not in the church. We're not allowed to ask questions in the church. We're not allowed to even clothing decisions. We're not allowed to wear pants. We're not allowed to do certain things with our hair, our makeup. Um, you know, we're um, not allowed to wear shorter skirts or shorts or anything like that. We have to be super modest. Um, our dress code, we had to wear dresses and skirts three inches below our knees so that when we sat down, our knees didn't show because, you know, men go crazy over knees, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Sounds like so, um, similar to my Bob Jones University time. Mm, yeah, actually, um, that was one of the colleges that they um, really promoted for people to go to, Bob Jones and Pensacola Christian. Yep. Um, I actually went to Pensacola Christian for two weeks for a volleyball camp, and it was awful. Even just being an outsider there temporarily for volleyball camp, it was not fun <laughs> at all. I believe um, it. Yeah, so we weren't treated as equal because they honestly believed that we weren't equal. Um, it's, you know, we didn't have any kind of self esteem, self respect. Um, we were just an afterthought that, that it is a good word. We were an afterthought because men were up front and running the world. Um, women, they really looked down on women having jobs. Um, and this actually, um, is something else that I wanted to talk to you about is the whole educational, um, system of, of their schools. Um, I mean, that can be another conversation for later, of course, but, um, they really didn't push women to go to college, hmm. um, at all. Um, at all. It was, um, it's, just because like the home economics kind of stuff was all you really needed. If you could. Yes bake well and homeschool your kids and, you know, raise your kids to love Jesus. That's pretty much. Like that's pretty what, much it for you. Yeah. yeah. And you mentioned the whole idea of, of women not speaking in church. Um, mm -hmm. Did you, did you ever see anybody attempt to, I don't know, buck that or, or did you feel like most of the women in your world were pretty much falling in line with that mentality? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't really, I can't really think of anyone who ever really fought it. Mm -hmm. And women in the church and school that I grew up in were pretty passive. Um, I mean, when you're told that from a certain age, then that's what you think reality is. So you don't really question it unless you're exposed to something else that makes you start thinking. Um, now, there, there were a couple of times now that I, I'm thinking about it where like when I was in high school, like an outsider kid would come in and like if they were kicked out of public school or something, um, they wouldn't take those kids a lot of the times, but they would go through like an extensive interviewing process. And, you know, some of them got in, most of them didn't. 
Um, there were some people who got in and were very promptly kicked out. Um, they didn't last very long, but they did kind of protest a little bit. But if they started protesting too much, that's when they just, you know, disappeared <laughs> and we never yeah. saw them again. Um, yeah. It's interesting. I'm curious, a couple of things before we go back to your main main trail of your story. Um, you touched on the idea of, of clothing and modesty, and that, that kind of could be its own topic as well, but just to kind of touch on it briefly, and and then we'll, we'll leave that part for the rest of the interview. But when, a, when girls are given the message of, you know, you, you have these brothers in Christ that you need to not make them fall, not tempt them, you know, don't show too much. Don't even, even if you're modest in your clothing, don't be too flirtatious in your behavior. You get the sense, I would think, that men can't control themselves, number one. And yeah. that if if anything does happen, there's a really good chance it's your fault. You yeah. were too flashy or showy or not modest enough, not covered enough. Um you you weren't being careful with the way that you you dressed or 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 behaved in some way and that now that this guy has like if, if you found, if you were to find out for example from the side that the guys are all like in their prayer meeting and saying we're really struggling you know because you know we're tempted by the girls or if something actually happens where a guy does something and in the like say it's you know a, a guy in the church does something that's inappropriate and it comes to light this whole question of well clearly he was a sinner he did something inappropriate but <clears throat> did it leave you with would it have left you with that feeling of like i wonder if that girl wasn't really obeying god in terms of protecting him by by keeping herself ultra modest or whatever you however you call it just all this responsibility on women and all this blame and and i'm kind of baiting here with saying this but i, I hear so many stories where you see these things actually happen in real stories in churches and then the women are are very timid to come forward and they finally do and they think the answer is going to be that the church leadership is going to come rally around me and they're mm -hmm. going to support me and instead over and over you hear these stories and i'm sure there's some alternative stories but the stories that you keep hearing over and over are the church either directly or indirectly attacks and insinuates it, it was either partially or potentially even wholly her fault. Do mm -hmm. you ever get that sense when you talk to people about how they see all those issues? You know, when I was going through it, I don't recall having any issues like that when um, I was in church and school. Um, they, it was a pretty small school. So mm -hmm. there were maybe 30 people from kindergarten to 12th grade. So okay you know, there wasn't really a lot of scandals and stuff like that, um, that I knew of. Um, and also, um, I honestly did not really even think about, you know, sexual harassment, sexual abuse, things like that going on in the church until very recently. Um, I was doing a search on independent Baptist and I came up with all these stories about how, like you said, something happened. And, you know, a woman has a relationship with a man or heaven forbid she got, you know, raped. Um, and she tells the, the church leaders and every single story ends the same way. The woman blames and, you know, she's this evil you know, Jezebel or whatever they call them. And the men are always in the right. Well, he didn't mean to or, you know, it was your fault for leading him astray or for making him do this horrific thing it's never the man's fault no matter what the man does it is never the man's fault it's always blamed on the woman no matter what um i i i'm i feel very fortunate that that didn't happen to me and i to my knowledge that wasn't something that really went on in the school that I went to. Um, but people like that are very good at keeping things like that under the rug and not out in public. Um, so I don't really know of any like actual issues or scandals from my personal church. Well, that's good. Um, yeah. 
I think the issue that comes up a lot for from my perspective is that it's basically creating like a double world for especially for guys, but I'm sure for for ladies too. But the idea of you know guys aren't supposed to to look, they're not supposed to think about it, and guys are going to look, they're going to think about it, and so you have this like facade where you have to be the good guy up front in church, you know, you know, taking the offering or leading prayer or whatever. You have to be very, very clean cut. And everyone mm-hmm. thinks of you as, as a, as a model and as upstanding. And yet you, you're going to go back to your, you know, to your closet, so to speak, and you're going to think about things that you want to think about. And so people end up having these double lives. And I, I don't think the church is really dealing with, the idea of what that does to people psychologically to, to put them in this. And it's funny because James talks about, you know, double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. But, you know, if, if you're double-minded, you really are going to struggle. If you're thinking on the, on the one hand, I want so much to be thinking about intimacy and, and sexuality and eroticism. And yet I can't, I, I need to make sure I don't think about any of it. Like I need to just be yeah. completely pure you you end up putting people in this spot where they're they're basically like splitting splitting their personalities and then another side issue that comes out of it is you hear these stories where people finally do get married and it's like okay you can finally enjoy yourself but because you've had this environment where you've told somebody don't think about it it's dirty it's bad you know you're you're you know you're you're doing something evil if you even think about it or look suddenly you're supposed to get married and just fully dive into it. And people, a lot of people talk, I mean, some people do fine, but a lot of people talk about how they struggle because they feel like they can't just go from this is so dirty to this is now wonderful. And it's, did you ever either personally or in front with friends think through some of those issues and and reflect on that? Yeah. So as far as sex ed goes in my school, we got nothing. Uh, We were taught that sex was bad and that it was evil and absolutely do not do it before marriage because you will go to hell. (laughs) Um, Did they actually phrase it that way? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, if you were like a Christian, maybe you weren't really a Christian, you know, if you have sex outside of marriage. Maybe you weren't real and genuine about it enough. So it wasn't that that Um, sin would cause you to go to hell. It was that that sin was evidence you weren't weren't saved. Right. You were just fake. Probably. And, you know, a real Christian would never, you know, have sex outside of marriage. As far as sex ed goes, like I said before, we got nothing. It was bad. It was evil. Um, Don't have it until you're married. And even then, after you're married, if you're a woman, don't enjoy it, heaven forbid, because it's just not something for women to enjoy. That's a man thing. And women should view it as a duty because we are only here for procreation and to serve our husbands. Right. So it's more of a duty women than it is um something you know fun um yeah i think that being denied um sex ed or telling a teenager whose hormones are going crazy that you know sex is bad and it's evil and you can't have it or do it or think about it it is very damaging psychologically um because you know at that age your hormones are just kind of coming up and it's you know, I'm not saying go crazy, but it's a natural thing. You know, it's a natural feeling. Um, Instead of giving you education on how to support yourself during, you know, this time when everything in your life is changing, they just tell you that you're evil and that you need to focus on God and get right with him. Um, Hmm. So I was like 14, 15 years old, and I didn't even know what sex was because I just, you know, was told that it was evil and bad and you weren't allowed to do it unless you were married. So, you know, like, what is sex even? They didn't even tell us, like, the details of what it was, just that it was bad and wrong. So, you know, that leads to a whole nother issue of, you know, how do you act around the opposite sex? You know, if you do find yourself attracted to them, you know, why am I attracted to them? What's going on? You know, what we don't know. We don't have any education to support that, those mm. feelings. So yeah, it makes it very awkward. And yeah, yeah, and you feel like almost like even if you're just hanging out, but as you said, maybe attracted to someone at the school or whatever at church, that maybe there's a part of you that's getting into a sexual realm, even if you don't know what sex is, like maybe this is yeah. becoming sexual and maybe I'm doing something bad. And 
is yeah. very strange. Like if you're walking down the hall and you accidentally brush their arm, oh my goodness, did I just have sex with them? Like you don't know what sex is. I know that sounds really ridiculous, but you it don't know. That, yeah. uh, we had this rule in our school. It was called the six inch rule where guys and girls have to stay six inches apart at all times. And that was very strictly enforced. If we were sitting, we weren't allowed to sit like in the same row of chairs during chapel. We weren't allowed to sit together. We had to sit in different um, pews, different sections. The guys sat over there. The girls sat over there. Um, we weren't allowed to have the same like PE classes because, you know, we actually had to play sports where we might come into contact with each other. So we weren't allowed to do any kind of physical activity, sports and stuff together. Um one girl I remember got into so much trouble. She got a detention or two, maybe. Um, the guy in front of her was, um, he passed his exam and he got like a really high score on it. And she patted him on the back and said, good job. She got a detention for that. She got into a lot of trouble just because she physically came into contact with him. Good job. Mm -hmm. She patted him on the back. And, and that was, I mean, they put a stop to physical contact between the two sexes quickly. Like they do not tolerate things like that at all. Hmm. So, wow. yeah. It's, That's amazing. Well, um, yeah. steering us back to your main uh, story, I did want to ask for one more clarification, then we'll keep going. You mentioned the word you finally got saved. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you were you were left off. You were, you were threatened with hell, with the rapture, tribulation, all these things. Um, you, you were certainly taught you were a bad person in need of, of redemption. What is salvation mean like what does it mean to get saved as a christian okay so when you're a sinner and you feel really bad and you're scared of dying and going to hell you can realize that you can confess to jesus that you believe in him as your personal savior and that he died in order to save you from hell and you tell him that you believe in that story and you thank him for it and from now on you Surrender your life and yourself to him because he saved you from this horrible place and you'll do whatever he says or whatever you think he says. Um, and that means that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. Hmm. So that's what I wanted when I was seven years old. So I got saved. I prayed and told Jesus that I believed in him and that, you know, when I die, I want to go to heaven instead of hell. He wouldn't. Um, <laughs> So afterwards, they always say that you feel like a burden has been lifted off of your shoulders. You'll feel happy. You'll feel peaceful. You'll feel just ecstatic. And I felt absolutely nothing, nothing, nothing. When I you felt, say you, you felt nothing, do, do you mean like right after you'd said a prayer? Yes. Okay. So right after I was finished praying, you know, I was crying and everything and I did not feel peaceful. I did not feel happy. I did not feel any of the things that they said that I would feel. I didn't feel like I had this huge burden lifted off of my shoulders. I was seven years old. What burdens did I even have? Hmm. Was <laughs> um, that with your, I haven't even with your parents or with the church or where did you pray? With my mom. Okay. With my mom at home by ourselves. It was private. My dad, um, I guess this is noteworthy, was a truck driver. So he was only at home on the weekends, um, hmm. every other weekend usually. So my mom and I were at home by ourselves pretty much all the time. And she was the only one home when I felt the urge to get saved. So it was just me and her. She helped me. She led me through um, a prayer. We didn't use like a specific, I think there is a specific like sinner's prayer out there, but we yeah. just prayed whatever we felt. And afterwards, I even told her, I don't feel any different. I don't feel like you know, happy and peaceful and everything. And she just said, you know, give it some time, go to your room, think about it, maybe read the Bible, whatever. Read the Bible. I was seven. I mean, come on. <laughs> um, hmm. So I did. And I, I just did not feel any different at all. The nightmares were still there. I was still afraid of dying and going to hell. I was still afraid that the rapture would take place and I would be left behind. I still had just this fear that's all that I knew from the time that I was born this is the time I was seven years old was just fear and 
terror. I mean, I didn't really know of any other emotions to feel because that's all that, you know, all that I had going on in my life was being taught about hell and the rapture and stuff. And I just didn't know what else to feel. So that's mm-hmm. still how I felt. I didn't know what being peaceful felt. They say that, you know, you'll feel this peace that passes all understanding. And I had no conception of that. Like I had no idea what that even was or what that even meant because I'd never felt peace before. And I sure didn't feel it after I got saved. So I thought, you know, something was even more wrong with me. Like, did I not pray hard enough? Am I not believing? Do I really not believe in this? And that kind of gave way to me telling you before, like I kept trying to convince myself that something, that this was real, but I felt off like it wasn't real Hmm. um that i was just trying to convince myself this is real this is real this is real um did you get tempted to say it over and over like to say maybe it wasn't real the first time but if i do it a second time maybe that'll be more real yeah so you know several more years went by and i just felt awful um i didn't feel any different and i just kept trying to convince myself that you know this is real And I felt like, you know, because I didn't resonate with this teaching that I was the one that was, that was off and it wasn't, you know, because it really wasn't real. Um, I got saved a couple more times. Um, I think a few, I think I was maybe 10 or so somewhere like that when I was um, saved again. And I did not feel any different whatsoever. I felt the same. Um, the last time I tried to get saved, I was 14 years old and still, I did not feel any different whatsoever. Um, I felt the same. Hmm. So, and the the implication that's often given in those contexts is if there's a problem where you don't feel the peace or you don't feel close to God, that it's always you, because Mm -hmm. even if you were to say you were like a, um, you know, a, a child who had disobeyed his father, like in the prodigal son story, you you get this picture presented a lot in church of like, you may go away from God and it feels like you've gone a thousand miles from him. But if you turn around, he's actually right there. He's, he's like, he's chasing yeah. you almost like as a love story, like he's pursuing you. Um, kind of like the, in the Old Testament, that prophet that was supposed to marry, I forget which one, I was supposed to marry Gomer. And he, like God says, go marry this, this prostitute and bring her, you know, to your house and make her your wife. And then when she bears a child, but then goes off and, you know, goes back to her, her former lovers, he's supposed to just pursue her again and bring her back. And like, you know, that's like this picture of us, like we're this prostitute of a person, of a, of a church that keeps on going after our, our lovers, meaning sin. And God is, but God's right there. He just, he wants you so much and he'll pursue you. And it's just so loving and, uh, you know, ignore the stalkerish part of it, but he's so loving and he just wants you, you know, so bad. He'll do anything. He'll, do, he'll absolutely chase you. Even if you're that one sheep out of a hundred and there's 99 that are safe, he'll go pursue you as the one sheep that's missing. And you get this sense of like, if there's a problem, it can't be God. It certainly can't be the Bible. Um, you know, it can't be God's fault. He's perfect. So if there's a problem, if you don't feel it, if you're not close, if you're not obedient, the problem is really clear. It's you. And yeah. There's no, there's no alternative. It's always, and the, all the, the end goal is always like, no matter what you're doing right now and how you're feeling, the end goal is I have to get back to Christ. I got to get closer and closer yeah. and closer and more committed. And it does something to you where you just, you're constantly thinking if this doesn't work, I'm just, I'm still broken. I might've been saved technically in the sense of I've been judicially declared righteous before God and the swap has occurred. Christ's righteousness is on me. My sin has been placed on Christ. He took my, my punishment, but I'm still really, I'm messed up because I don't feel it. And that's, it does something to you. It does. It does. Um, and you know, I had so much anxiety. I was severely depressed all the time. Um, I was never happy. I didn't even want to be alive. I mean, I don't mean to say that I was suicidal because I wasn't at the time, but I, at the same time, I just had no desire to be alive because reality was so awful. Um, And I felt so horrible all the time. Um, That's Mm. the best I can describe it. I wasn't suicidal. I just didn't want to be alive. If that makes sense. Um, It was more of a passive feeling like, 
And at the same time, you know, I didn't want to die because I was afraid of going to hell. Um, it just really messes with you, with your head, because they tell you that you should feel a certain way and you just don't. And, you know, the problem is with you. And I just knew that I couldn't live my life trying to convince myself of everything all the time. I read this quote, and I think it was Psychology Today magazine, where if you build, I, I'm probably butchering the quote, <laughs> where religion is like trying to build like a cubicle out of post-it notes. You're constantly trying to hold it up. And if one part falls and you have to let go of another part and it falls while you're trying to fix this part, and eventually it'll just all collapse and fall around you. You know, if not in this lifetime, then maybe another one. Um, hmm. And it's not a stable, they don't give you like a stable environment to, you know, help you fix yourself. They constantly blame you. Well, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. You need to pray harder, you need to do this, you need to do that. They're not supporting you psychologically to, want to you know help yourself and to grow they're just blaming you they're not you know they tell you that you need to do all this stuff but they're not offering you any support in order to do it um it's just hmm. hateful blaming and well, you need to fix this well how do i fix it pray harder that's always the answer to pray harder but if you don't feel anything when you pray even if you spend hours praying and you don't feel anything then what else am I supposed to do? You know, it's confusing when you think that that's all there is out there because that's your ultimate reality and you don't know any difference hmm. because you're never exposed to anything else. So what you're bringing up makes me think kind of as a side note about the theological issue of Calvinism. Did you ever get tempted to wonder, maybe I'm not elect? Did that come into your theology at all? Um, you know, I don't really so my church viewed um things as they are the chosen people who are going to heaven but you have an option to believe too like they they don't i don't think that they believe in like the predestination or the preordained they believe that it's open to everyone but um yeah. you know not everyone's going to want to be like them but if you do want to be like them then you can uh, if you want to um, so it's not like a predestined kind of thing. I yeah, more don't of a free will perspective. Think. Yeah, yeah, that's what they believed in. I think, to the best of my knowledge, or yeah, most, I think most Baptists are are on the Armenian side of it. I was curious with with this whole, you know, questioning: Am I am I doing it wrong? Am I am I saved? What's wrong? One of the questions that came up for me in my journey was was not as much strictly what you just said, but it was the issue of, of hearing from God. I had specifically during my time at uh, Lancaster Bible College, I did an internship with a, a pastor and also with the elders of the church. And, and one of the elders took me aside one night and, uh, you know, as you do after like a Wednesday night prayer meeting, we just kind of, he had keys to the church and we just, you know, took some chairs to the back foyer and, and sat there quietly and, you know, lovely man, not, not, this isn't like against him at all. Lovely man, lovely family, but he, he, he was very, what I would have described at the, at the time as a little bit more touchy feeling in his theology. And he, he said, what is God telling you? And I said, you mean like, like through the Bible? He's like, no, no, no. Like, what is he specifically telling you? And I, I struggled to answer it. And I said, do you mean like, what is he leading me to do? Like, does, do I feel led to be a pastor to do missions? He's like, well, yeah, but more specifically, like, what has God been saying to you recently? Like, you've been feeling like you want to be a pastor for years, but what has he said to you in the last month? And I remember thinking, I don't know what you're talking about. God doesn't talk to me. And we, we kind of went round about it for probably a good hour, trying to make sure I understood the question clearly. <laughs> but the end goal of it, the end result of it was like, I don't hear from God. Like, I don't yeah. hear, he's not telling me anything new. He's telling me stuff, so to speak, through the Bible, but I'm not getting any messages from God. And it left me thinking, there's something wrong with me. And I know a lot mm -hmm. of Pentecostal and, and charismatic people have told me similar stories where all their friends are speaking in tongues. 
or have some kind of ecstatic experience. They've got dreams and visions. You know, God gave me a word of knowledge, word of prophecy to give you. And they don't have it. And they feel in this in that particular church environment, which wasn't my environment, but they feel in that environment like, I guess I'm deficient. I guess there's something wrong with me because I'm not experiencing this. And did you ever have anyone try to get you into more of that Pentecostal side of it and just be like, God's speaking to you. Why don't you hear his voice? Why are you shutting him out, so to speak? Yeah. So after I graduated, well, right before I graduated high school, when I turned 18, I quit going to the Independent Baptist Church because they were just too much. Um, I started going to a church down the street and they were a four square church. So they're a lot like Pentecostals. Um, I think that they're the same. I don't really know a lot of the details, but I think they're like a sect off the Pentecostals. I, I'm not sure. But yeah, so they believe that God, you know, is constantly speaking to you. You just need to look around you and to listen. And if you listen and you open your eyes up to him, then you will see messages from him all around you. You know, if you know, look to nature, look to you know, anything, and you'll see his messages clearly, right? So, you know, I tried that, and I just never felt like he was speaking to me. Um, I never really felt anything. I felt more at home with these people because they weren't quite as far right as the Independent Baptists. I, we were allowed to wear pants. Women were pastors. Actually, our pastor wasn't like our pastor and his wife it was pastors tom and opie were their names they lovely people um so they were viewed as equal um so i really liked that and i had a lot of really cool friends there when i was a little older so right when i turned 18 i left the independent baptist church and started going there and yeah they were a little bit more charismatic and people spoke in tongues and it was really weird for me for you know, someone standing right next to me to all of a sudden start speaking in tongues. It scared me to death at first <laughs> when it first happened. Um, did you get judged for going there by any of your family or friends? They did not. My mom didn't really like it when I first started going there, but she got used to it. Okay. Um, she did a lot of research and stuff, and she ultimately did not have a say in what, where I went because I was 18 and could go wherever I wanted. But she felt a little hesitant at first but then she was like well her going to church there is better than no church at all so um she was okay with it after a while because i was happy there and i i had my friends finally and um yeah she was okay with it Hmm. but yeah they were a lot more open um about about you know where to look for messages from god he you know might not be speaking people different people hear god in different ways some people get messages right to their head and they feel like god is speaking to them directly some people might see you know if you ask god to send you a sign you might look outside and see something um like a i don't know a bird fly by or something um you know god speaks to different people in different ways with what this church told us um there were many different views of the bible you could question the bible if you had questions you could openly ask them even on sunday morning in church um they were very open-minded and i would not go as far as to call them liberal because by liberal standards they're very conservative but um they were a lot more liberal than than the independent baptists um, so I did feel more at ease there, but eventually, you know, I quit going there too, obviously. So mm. that's, you know, further in my story, of course, but yeah. So they were a little bit more open as to God's messages and where to look. It's so. funny when you talk about God giving people different messages and, and you know, seeing a bird fly by and maybe that's God trying to encourage you or something. It was always funny to me how in a somewhat similar way in Bible studies, there would often be this sense of, um, like you'd open it and instead of instead of it being a teacher instructing and saying this is what this first means this is the context this is what it meant to the you know first century christians it was often more like a, what does this mean to you or what stands out to you and there was almost to this this sense on a, on a more personal you know private devotional level like if if you like if you could ideally do it you would read through the bible like you know verse by verse and you get the context but there would be times when maybe you didn't have anything set up and you were 
short on time. So you just open the word of God and whatever you could almost like, like just like close your eyes and just open it. And hopefully you'd land in the Psalms and hopefully not in a precatory Psalm. <laughs> hopefully you'd land in the Psalms and you would be like, almost like God meant for you to land on page, you know, 1,169 on okay. this particular Psalm. And that that was like God's way of saying, this is my Psalm for you for today, mm -hmm. for you specifically. Yeah. And it's, it's crazy to me when I look back at it, to think what, what insanity that whole worldview is, but <laughs> it's like, you know, this, this Psalm that's been there for thousands of years, it's suddenly God's new message for you today. It's exactly what you need to hear. And of course, if it, if it, doesn't resonate with you like okay maybe i just need to read a little bit more read read page two or three till something pops and then that's you know that's god's message and it's like you just look for anything and, and of course if if nothing if, if if there's no pattern if there's no sense of okay god gave me a message there's always this sense of well i must not be listening right or there's something coming for like almost like just wait like almost like christmas wait yeah. for it wait for it the presents are coming and yeah. it's it's amazing the way that it, it kind of it's like, you know, I don't know. Did you ever do crabbing? When I was little, we used to go crabbing in um, Bethany Beach, Delaware. You'd, you'd take a piece of chicken, like, a you know, get a chicken drumstick and tie a string on it. And you would have this long string and you throw it way out in the in the canal. And you'd, you'd eventually feel the crabs are, are biting it. And you just slowly, like, just like one little half inch at a time, you just pull it in. And then when they're still biting at it right there at the bank, you take your big net and scoop it up. And it's like this sense of like, God is just, or, or the, the whole world is just like pulling you in. Like you just, you need to keep biting, keep biting. If it doesn't work today, just keep biting. It's going to be good. And the problem is for so many of us, it, it never, it never works out. And it's not, it's not going to work out because like you said before, it's not real. It's mythology. Um, right. Anyway, I, it's a side note, but I just wanted to add that it came to mind. <laughs> I've never heard of crabbing like that before. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I know people use cages too. We used to do the string in the chicken. Um, I, was, <laughs> I was curious with um going back a little bit to your earlier story before we kind of talk about the the last few steps before your deconversion did you have any exposure to christian summer camps and did that play any part in your story so i went to camp one time um for two weeks i believe <clears throat> called camp joy have you heard of Camp Joy? I think it's so. in North Carolina, maybe. I can't really remember exactly where it was. It was close by Tennessee, where I grew up, um, and just a few hours away. So I think North Carolina. Um, we went there for a couple of weeks one time. Um, it, I don't really remember that much about it. Um, you know, obviously, we went to chapels and stuff like that. But um, I remember... They had a swimming pool and guys and girls obviously were not allowed to swim at the same time. Obviously. It was way up on a hill and it was fully enclosed in fences that you could not see through. And we weren't even allowed to look up the hill when the guys were swimming. So <laughs> even though you couldn't see the swimming pool, we weren't even allowed to look in that direction when we were down there and the guys were up there. Um, even when the, the girls were swimming by themselves, we had to wear one piece bathing suit, the cool lot on top. So we couldn't wear, you know, just the regular bathing suit. Um, mm. that's all that I remember from that. We did horseback riding. We did arts and crafts. I don't remember that much about it because I was young. Okay. So it wasn't I was, a... Well, I was young. I was 14 years old. Um, so it wasn't like a, a like a lot of you know kids experience in summer camps these days um the school the the independent baptists they're very old-fashioned and fundamental so they don't do a lot of like fun stuff um they don't really believe in having fun if you know what i mean they believe more that you should be scared and serious and <laughs> you know if you have fun then you're getting too comfortable yeah. um you're getting too comfortable so you um aren't really told to go out and have fun if that makes sense every so often it's fine but um, on that note did you feel like part of the issue of not having fun or, or rather being serious about life and about god was was to really keep your mind focused on sharing the gospel like were you encouraged to share mm -hmm. it with other people and was there any sense of like oh, if you yeah. don't share it you know it, you're kind of to blame for their yeah. outcome yes 
So witnessing to people was a huge thing that they tried to force us to do. I was very introverted when I was little. I was very shy. I did not like talking to strangers. I would get horrible social anxiety. So I would always like go off and hide and then come back later and say that I had talked to 10 people. (laughs) So, you know, I was the exact opposite of what I am now. Now I'm really outgoing and extroverted. But back then I was so scared of other people, especially, you know, they, the church from a very young age tries to divide, divide it to where there's us and there's them. So I was afraid of them, you know, us were, were pretty scary too, but them especially because you know they're sinners they're horrible people they'll try to educate you into thinking differently they'll try to you know talk back to you and and you have to learn all these tactics in order to circle circular reasoning you know you can't let them you know educate you into being educated (laughs) into thinking for yourself um so i was the universe is very old (laughs) yeah (laughs) right so I was very afraid of them. So I never really um, witnessed to anyone, even though it was strongly encouraged. I remember one time I went to Pensacola um, Christian College for the um, the volleyball camp. And one night we went to the beach and our instructor gave us like all of these tracks. I think they were those chick tracks, mm-hmm. the comic book ones that were really cool and popular. We had a bunch of them and we wanted, they made us go to witness to people. Um, I mean, just like regular people playing like beach volleyball and drinking their beers over a bonfire. And they wanted us to witness to these people. And me and one of my friends went off to the side and like hid behind the, the trash, like the dumpsters. And we sat there for like 20 minutes and we came back and we, I think we threw our tracks away. <laughs> So no one would have to read them mm. and um, we came back and we just lied because we were not about to, to witness to other people that was just you know embarrassing and horrible and um yeah we never did but we were very strongly encouraged too that was definitely one of the their tenets um what you have to do what you have to get comfortable doing because that's really where it's at with them is you spreading the gospel to other people you have to um put yourself out there because if you don't put yourself out there if you don't like this person is right here and if they are open to hearing the gospel at that time and you don't initiate that conversation and you don't tell them about the gospel you could be responsible for them going to hell you know so a lot of pressure was put on us for that you know it's It's amazing when, (laughs) when you talk about that aspect and it relates a little bit to some thoughts i meant to bring back about hell but this idea that God is so arbitrary where he's got this like arbitrary timeline where he says, you know, technically I I love you all humanity wise. You you are my children. I'm your ultimate father. I created you all, but I've got this timeline and and it's, it's Mm -hmm. different for each person. You know, some people are going to live till they're 80. So they got 90, hundred, they got plenty of time to think about it, but others are going to, you know, die much earlier, but whatever, whenever your time is up, it's up. And I, I am the kind of God who can say on the one hand, you must forgive. You must be forgiving. You must be so gracious. You must be over forgiving. How many times should I forgive? Seven times? No, 70 times seven. You must be ultra forgiving. But I, as God, the minute you die, the minute you take your last breath, I will never forgive you again, ever. Mm -hmm. Your forgiveness quota your, 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 your time frame is over. That door is locked and shut and barred. And yeah. it's amazing that concept. And then you put that in the con- in the, in the context of a person, like you said, where you're witnessing and you knowing that their time could be up, you know, they could be at the, you could be at the supermarket and they could yeah. get in a car accident on the way home and be done. Mm-hmm. You, you literally might be in their last five minutes of their life. I actually had a story about that. Um, There was this girl that went to school with me. She was several years older than me. She was in high school when I was in middle school, I think. And she had a friend who did not go to our church. And she was like a public school kid, you know, a sinner, obviously. And she was just always constantly witnessing to this girl. And she thought 
that she was saved. Like she was under the impression that she finally became saved and everything. And she actually did get in a car accident and she died. And when they, they came to the car, they found all of these rock um, cassette tapes in her glove compartment. And that made my friend or this girl that I knew aware of the fact, you know, she listens to rock music. She wasn't saved. I mean, she was crying all the time, not because of her friend who died, but because she, I mean, I'm sure that that was, you know, part of it, of course, but because she failed in witnessing to her friend, because, you know, what Christian would listen to rock music. If you listen to rock music, you were obviously not one of us and you're not a Christian because rock music is evil and satanic. So Hmm. she failed in her mission, in her mind. And like, she was just crying all the time about how she failed. Like she, you know, really didn't focus so much on mourning for her friend as she did mourning for the fact that she failed in her mission to successfully witness to this girl. Um, and it's just sad that people, you know, they, they put so much value into saving other people. Like there's no like, Christians can be very aggressive in in witnessing to other and trying to conform others to their own worldview. And I think that a lot of it is because they're afraid that it'll eventually come back to them if these people don't get saved, because that's one of the fear tactics that they use on young kids. You know, they tell them about hell and we'll go here. And later on, you know, if you don't successfully convince this person to believe the same way as you do, you could end up going to hell because, you know, you failed. <laughs> yeah. Um, even if you tried with good intention and you failed, then, you know, who knows? There's always yeah. this seed of doubt that they plant in your mind. You know, you have, you can't be fully at peace after you're saved, even after you're saved, because who knows if you really are saved or not. If you do one little thing, then maybe you weren't saved to begin with and you need to start all over again. Yeah. And it opens up the the can of worms too of that you need to be prepared for for giving the answer for the reason for the hope that's in you where yeah. maybe your issue of why you're not winning more souls so to speak is because you don't know the word of god that much you're mm-hmm. trying to just tell people in your own words and maybe the issue is you don't know your bible memorize your bible for going to say you know the, the word of god has the power to memorize it or maybe from an apologetics perspective, you just need to be more educated on why evolution mm-hmm. is so clearly, you know, wrong or yeah, just the, all the different philo- philosophy issues that you can think through. But you, you just, if you're not winning souls, you need to be more educated and more in the, in the word of God. And it, it's fascinating to me too, that one of the, and this is what I meant to get to earlier is hell. You, we keep talking about it, but it, I'd like to take just a second and, and, and stop on, and pause on this when you look at the concept of hell and I acknowledge there's Christians that don't think it's a burning place. They think it's annihilation or they think it's something else. Obviously Catholics have their perspective too, but a lot of us, a whole huge chunk of us grew up being told this is a real place of burning fire. It'll last forever. And it's not, Mm -hmm. it's not like a parable or, or a a picture of, you know, you being like CS Lewis would have put, you know, this, this great divorce where you're just like in some kind of selfish void where you just, you know, you're kind of caving in on yourself. It's an actual punishment. And we have these here in the kitchen, we have these black cast iron pans, you know, we use for, for cooking. And every once in a while, you know, we're very, very careful, Chris, but every once in a while, somebody will touch something that's hot. And of course we're, you know, very, very proactive in making sure that doesn't ever happen. But every once yeah. in a while, someone will just come, you know, run in the kitchen and touch something. And you, 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 of course, as, as a parent, you hear that immediate scream. You can see the little, mm-hmm. little burn on their finger. Yeah. You're putting um, ice on it right away. You're, you're coddling them and they're, they're crying their heads off. And you think as a parent, they, they had one little spot on the edge of their finger for mm-hmm. one millisecond. And the, the excruciating pain that was caused them for that, that one little moment in time, it breaks your heart. And then to think, and I'm going to be a little bit graphic here, but if you could imagine that there was a cast iron pan that was designed in, in hu- full human shape, and it was designed to literally have two sides that would close, kind of like, you know, how they have these pans that close and make an omelet so you can flip it. 
Yeah. You can imagine a pan that's shaped like a human and that you could put a human inside of it and then shut the other side like an omelet and lock it and then burn that, put that in, you know, on the stove or the oven. What, what parent in their right mind would not consider that the absolute worst psychotic torture to do to somebody? And yet <clears throat> that's exactly what the picture of hell is for us is, is this is going to be nonstop literal burning. And your father up in heaven, who says, forgive, forgive, forgive. If you, in fact, if you don't forgive, I will not forgive you. You have to forgive to enter the kingdom of heaven. This father that is so loving is going to put people in this burning thing forever. The idea that, and I know Christians always have their answers. If you understood the white hot holiness of God, you'd understand why God cannot accept sin and and you, you, God has to deal with it. And you have your chance in, 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 you know, in, on your lifetime. If you choose not to do it, you kind of, you asked for it. I'm sorry, but you had a chance. You had a chance to turn from yourself and your sin to the cross and to grace and to forgiveness, to Christ's righteousness. But you do, in fact, deserve this. And part of me, I understand it because that's where I came from. And I, I say that to my shame. I did not have a problem with that for a long time. But part of me feels like, if you believe monstrous stuff long enough without speaking up, you kind of become a bit of a monster in your mind. And yeah. if you're willing to say, I literally think that my kids, whether it's, you know, if I, if I lived in Old Testament times and my kid was, was belligerent long enough, I would have picked up the stones to stone them like the Bible commands. Or if my daughter was, you know, got pregnant before she got married in Old Testament times, you would have had to stone her. Um, whatever it was, you know, the idea that you can look at this stuff and say, absolutely, I stand with the God character. And I'm, you know, what I said before, I stand with God. Now I'll say the God character. I stand with the God character on this. This punishment is absolutely deserved. It, it's, it's a testament to me of how warped this worldview is. And, and jump in if you want to reflect that. I just want to make sure was, I added that because I, I feel like I keep on talking with people in different conversations about hell and I don't really dive into it too much. I feel like this might, this might be a good spot to do it, but mm -hmm. hell is an issue. Like you can't yeah. call God a loving father who mm -mm. emphasizes forgiveness when he is basically a psycho. I mean, yeah. this, he's an absolute psychotic personality. Yeah. So yeah, God, you know, loves you, but he also hates you and he wants to send you to this horrible place, but he's going to send his son who he's going to eventually kill to save you from this horrible place that God's going to put you into. He's killing his son to save you. I, I don't know. It's just this ridiculous reasoning that doesn't have any basis in reality at all. And Going back to like the descriptions of hell, like my mom was very big on hell and scaring me with hell when I was very young because she honestly thought that that was what was going to happen to me when I die. Like she was 100% convinced. So in her mind, she was doing a very good thing by telling a five-year-old kid about all the tortures and torments of hell because she's trying to save me from this place. And if I get scared enough into believing, you know, in Jesus, and I get scared enough to get saved, then I will be saved from this place. So, you know, in, in her mind, she was doing the right thing by telling me about this, this place that's horrible. Um, and I did burn my hand on so when I was little, I remember my mom told me not to and I looked at her and walked right up to the stove and put my hand on it. And Obviously, I took it off and I, I, I ended up in the ER. <laughs> yeah. um, so and she used that even. Um, she said that the hell or the fire of hell is a lot hotter than the stove. Mm. And we cannot even fathom the, the degree, like the temperature of it, because it's just so unlike what we experience with fire here. It's so much hotter. It's so much more tormenting. Um, people, I, I think people like her, um, use hell because they, you know, they care about their kids and they're so afraid that their kids are going to go to hell. So they try everything in their power to keep their kids out of a place like that. If you, 
Go ahead. If you had Sorry. asked her at that time, knowing what you just said, if you had asked her, if you had said theoretically, mom, you're right. It looks like I am headed to hell. Um, I don't believe this stuff. If you had said that to her and you'd followed up with these two questions, what do you think she would have said? Would you worship a God who does like when you're, when you're in heaven, when you mom, when you die, you go to heaven or, you know, whatever other person in church believes this, when you die and go to heaven and you, you from heaven can see me, just like it says, you know, they could see from Abraham's bosom, the people um, mm -hmm. burning in, in, in the flames. If you could see me in hell, would you still worship that God, knowing you can see me there, and that that God could stop it in a heartbeat? Would yes, you still worship I'm, that God? And then, secondly, I'm, would you be happy in heaven, knowing I'm in hell? I am pretty certain she would still worship God because it would be my fault, not God, because God, you know, is all merciful and graceful and forgiving, and it would be my fault for not believing in God. And as far as being happy, I think that she would probably say that being in God's presence would probably keep her from being sad hmm. because God's presence is just this all encompassing love. And you were probably unable to feel anything other than love and happiness in God's presence. So she would probably say that she would be unable to feel anything other than that. And that would be because of God protecting her maybe from seeing her daughter in, in hell. That's just what I would think. Yeah. It's amazing yeah. the way that that, that picture of, of what you're going to be transformed into in heaven. It's so, it's like, it destroys your humanity. Yeah. You know, like you're, they talk a lot about how you're going to be like the angels in heaven where you're not married, which is, it doesn't make sense in the book of Enoch sense because the Enoch angels clearly can fall and come down and have sex with women. Yeah. But, you know, it's like, it's more like the idea of you're not going to be assigned, uh, you know, a partner. You don't have to get married. It's not the same thing, even though you can. But this idea of like, you won't, you won't want it the same way. You won't want intimacy in a family. You'll want God and your joy will be, like you said, in the Lord. So, even though people are screaming in pain, you will just be like, oh, God, you're so Bless wonderful. You. And it, it yeah. just, it's, it's literally humanity destroying. And it's, yeah. it's just, I guess it's a good place to end that part of it. It just, it just shocks me. It just shocks me yeah. to know when that none of us, myself included, to my shame, I was, I'm, I'm not attacking them. I'm attacking myself in this. Yeah. We, we let so much of these bad ideas just fly just purely yeah. because that's what we're all saying is truth even though we yeah. have no reason to believe it. Did you ever question or feel the, the ability to question the narrative in terms of like the genocide stuff in the Old Testament and the, you know, the flood, you know, God kills everybody. God says, yeah. wipe everybody out, but keep everybody, you know, kill everybody, but the girls that are virgins, um, you know, you mm -hmm. can have a slave, you can even beat them. But, you know, yeah. did you, did you ever question that? Or did you hear anyone ever question that? Not really. Um, genocide, rape, slavery was things that we were taught you know the stories of you know joshua and jericho and all of that um, were stories that we were taught from a very young age and we never really thought of them in that light hmm. we saw you know they divide us into us and them and they were them and god destroyed them in the story um you know we were righteous um, we were the, on the right side because God was on our side. And if God tells us to do horrible things, then they're not horrible um, because God told us to, to wipe all these people out. Hmm. Um, you know, they could have converted to Christianity and have been saved, but they weren't. So we did the right thing, right? We never really thought of it in terms of genocide because that's right. just what, you know, back then, you know, people just, did things like that and and those were just fun stories that we learned i hate to use the word fun when it comes to stuff like that but you know there's even that song with joshua and the wall of jericho and we even like had a little um thing that we did it wasn't a dance because dancing was evil but um <laughs> it was like a, a we marched around like a imaginary wall and, and you know we blew the trumpets and then they collapsed and it was fun they make things like that to be fun for kids so they don't think about the actual issue at hand and you know how killing people is bad raping women and taking them as 
slaves are bad is a bad thing. Um, having slaves and beating slaves is a horrible thing. We don't, they don't teach you that in that life. They mm. ingrain it into your mind from a very young age. So you just take it for granted. Like, oh yeah, we killed all these people. We have slaves, you know, it's, we don't stop yeah. and say, wait a minute, this isn't right. But when it comes to like the Hebrews being slaves with the Egyptians, then, you know, it's a little different because the Hebrews are God's chosen and, you know, slavery is all of a sudden a bad thing <laughs> when it's God's people. Yeah. So, you know, it kind of the, the pick and choose which stories are bad, which stories are, are good. And, and it's flip flop. Um, yeah. It's funny you talk about the Joshua song, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. That was, that was the very first thing that I can recall that was directly the initiation of my deconversion. Yeah. Um, I was sitting here, uh, as you do as a Christian, you know, raising your kids to love Jesus, singing Jesus loves me, Jesus loves little children, the B-I-B-L-E, all those songs. Mm -hmm. And we're singing Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. And we'd sung it many times, many, many times. Uh, my, my younger brother's even named after that song. Wow. And yeah, my dad couldn't, they couldn't decide on a name for my little brother before he was born. And my dad heard that song on the Christian radio on the way to the hospital. And he's like, that's oh, it. Wow. It's a sign from God. His name is Joshua. <laughs> um, but I remember listening to that song or think hearing that song as we're singing it and thinking, I know what happens next in the story, even though it stops with just the walls come tumbling down. Yeah. I know what the next parts of that are. And eventually the kids will also learn what the next parts are, which means I am kind of complicit in saying, this is a good thing. This is God's story. This is a good story we should applaud. And I remember thinking, I don't, I don't feel comfortable with that. And what, yeah. like, is this a problem? And it, of course I had no idea I'd be leading to deconversion. It was just more like, I don't know what to do with this, but this doesn't feel right anymore. Yeah. And, but that was, I'm sure there were other steps that occurred that I wasn't really reflecting on at the moment. But at that time, that, that literally was the first step I can recall that said, something's wrong here. Something's very wrong yeah. with this worldview. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I would never teach my kids anything like that. Um, I would be horrified if, if anyone taught my kids anything like that, like I'm kind of scared to, I mean, we live far away from home. So my mom hasn't really, you know, especially when COVID hit, we haven't seen her in a long time, but she's already given them like, Bibles, like little kid Bibles and stuff. And I mm -hmm. did not show them to, you know, I, I don't give them to my kids. Um, I was looking um, through one of them one time and it was really creepy looking back on it. This kid version of the story of when the angel came to Mary and told Mary that she was pregnant and it was God's child and, you know, everything, even though she was a virgin at the time. Um, the, the way that they reworded it for kids is just creepy because Mary was like questioning like that I don't want to or something and the angel was like well it's okay because God wants this and I'm like she was it was creepy like I would never I think that's when I was like this is going in the trash I'm not even going to donate it so another kid can get it it's going in the trash <laughs> yeah I mean is some of the bible stories that you tell kids are just wrong I mean yeah <laughs> Even a, Noah's flood is is so acceptable. You can go buy Fisher Price stuff at you know the toy store and, yeah. and get a Noah's flood thing. But you're like you're talking about the the in that story the Yahweh character kills everybody. He yeah, kills babies yeah. that are born yesterday. Yeah, I mean he kills every single person except for the people and the animals that were on the boat. Um, there, yeah. There's just so much bloodshed and violence in the Old Testament, and we're very, we're very um, desensitized to it because it's just a story that we've heard since we were little, and we don't really stop to think about it. And then, you know, sometimes some adults do, like you, um, like when you had kids, you were like, right, shouldn't be teaching my kids this. Um, yeah. And thank goodness you had that moment of clarity, because if you hadn't, where would you be right now? 
Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so good that, you know, we've been able to kind of separate ourselves from this story that we've been taught since we were little and we see it for what it really is. And, you know, if we were taught to do that at a young age, then <laughs> the world would be completely different than what it is right now. Um, it's, it's scary. And I'm definitely, you know, going to teach my kids to think for themselves and not to rely on some outside source like the Bible or, or pastors. And, hmm. and that, can I ask a question about that? I'm assuming um, sure. that you know, you or your husband are in agreement on, on that mentality, but do you know of anybody who, where it's a, it's a split where one of the couples has deconverted and the other one isn't and how would you, if you did know someone, um, how would you counsel them or advise them if they were in, in such a spot where, like you're saying things that you would be horrified if your kids were taught. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and yet there are some families, mine included, um, where that's, you know, that, that is life. You, you have, yeah. you have a parent that is absolutely committed. Like you said, like they, they have to warn them. They have to warn the kids, you know, hell's coming if you don't believe. Yeah. Um, I don't have any friends who have kids who are like that. Um, I do have one friend who's definitely a believer and they go to church and they take their kids to church, but, um, you know, it's more of a, a liberal Christianity, which is harmful to its own, but, you know, it's not quite as harmful. They don't believe in a literal hell and stuff like that, but, you know, it, it is still slightly harmful to kids. Um, I'm very glad that we are in agreement with not taking our kids to church because that's just, I am very thankful for that. Um, when I was in the Foursquare church, I had a friend whose parents were like that. His dad was a hardcore science believing atheist who just, you know, anything that had to do with God was just ridiculous to him. Um, and his mom was just the exact opposite. She was really into like speaking in tongues and everything. She was very conservative while he was very liberal in his politics and, and complete opposites of each other. They had been married for forever. And I mean, they had a very good marriage from what I know of it anyway. They see, always seem very happy together and they're still married happily. And uh, their kids, he, uh, my friend, he was a, um, an atheist, just like his dad. Uh, actually, he was a lot like me, more like atheist with a side of like Eastern kind of philosophies and stuff. So him and his dad were like that. And his sister was Christian, like very Christian, very conservative. And he would come to church. Like I didn't even know that he was an atheist until I got to know their family. Um, he would come to church just to like see what it was his kids were being taught because to him that could be very harmful and he wanted to like counter educate them against what they were being taught in church hmm. i cannot even imagine growing up in that environment while one parent is trying to tell me that you know jesus and god and hell and heaven are real and the other one is like no that's bullshit it's not true and i i couldn't even imagine like trying to grapple with that as a kid who doesn't even know what reality is to begin with um mm. no i'm very glad that you know my husband and i are in agreement with no religion um i don't i mean if my kids want to grow up and go to church after you know they leave home then that's fine. But I just want, you know, if they walk into it knowing what it is and, and, um, you know, with an open mind and whatever, I just want to teach them to be good people and they don't have to be a Christian, be a good person. Um, that's another thing that Christians, they think that they have a monopoly on morality. Um, you know, if you're an atheist and obviously you don't have any morals and you don't have that spiritual compass to, um, you know, go through life with so you're just this lost being with no morals doing horrible things you know you're probably a you know a sex addict like you said before or worse um you can easily i mean they do not have a monopoly on morality at all you can teach kids to be good people without religion and that's what i want to do with mine hmm. that's awesome yeah. yeah it does it it definitely is a hard thing when you're when you're in a split situation and that's where I'm at. I mean, my kids, yeah. at the very moment we're speaking, my kids are in, in Sunday school and church. 
it's a very hard, yeah. hard journey. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna. Um, I was gonna ask you to uh, take us back to your story. But go ahead and comment, and then I'll ask my question. Oh, I don't know. Like, if I, I'm not trying to give advice or anything, of course. But if I had any advice for anyone like that, um, for kids especially, I would definitely um, show them like how to discern not right from wrong, but right from wrong, I guess. Um, Hmm. kind of step back and detach yourself from the situation and look at it you know from a an objective viewpoint like does this resonate with me if not then you know you don't believe in it it's fine it's okay not to believe in something yeah. um you can't find all the answers in the outside world you have to go within and get to know yourself and where you are in the world and, and what your reason for being here is. And you need to be fully grounded in yourself before you can, I, I don't know, it's a slippery slope. I'm Yeah, well, it makes sense. I, I think you use the phrase, I think, counter-education or something like that, counter-educate. Yeah. And it is, it's true. I think when you tell kids about, you know, you can be, you can be moral without a God. And yeah. especially when you add in very specifics about Christianity, where you can tell kids, number one, let's talk about comparative mythology. You know, mm -hmm. there was a whole bunch of stories from other religions where a virgin, usually named Mary mm -hmm. or, a ver or a version of it, uh, conceived some kind of child who, you know, at, at the age of like 10 or 12, does some amazing thing that impresses everybody. You know, in their in their young, you know, babyhood, they're threatened with death, where the the king or somebody's going to kill them because they're afraid they're a threat. They grow up and they impress everybody, and then, very, very, very often, around age thirty, they have some kind of initiation with you know baptism, uh, some kind of temptation, and and then they do all these miracles, and and then they have some kind of horrible death. And you can you can literally like give them like this comparative mythology, the hero's journey sense. And, and they're mm -hmm. like, oh, I can see this fits into a, a pattern. But then also, I think it's really critical to tell people exactly where stuff came from. Like, yeah. you know, there were stories of, of uh, I forget, was it Vespasian or one of the other kings where he, would, he was known for these stories where he would take mud and put it on blind people's eyes and they would wash mm -hmm. it off and they could see. Um, there were stories where, you know, I've talked about this a lot. I'm sure you've heard it, but Pythagoras with 153 fish, like Jesus doing this and they pull them in, they count the fish. It's exactly 153. That's an exact copy of a Pythagoras story. Um, there's yeah. endless co copies from the, from the Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, from the Bacchae and from Virgil, from Plutarch. Uh, so many copies of all, of all these other stories. And when you can literally tell them, like, I can tell you exactly where this story looks like it came from like almost verbatim and, and the Dionysius story with Jesus turning water into wine. Some of that is literally copy like phrases word for word for word yeah. out of existing mythology. And I think <laughs> if, if you just give kids that information, you're not even necessarily being competitive or belligerent about it. You're just saying, I'm just going to give you all the information. Mm -hmm. It gives them a perspective to say, okay. Yeah. And, and also I think the empowerment issue to say, nobody can threaten you with what you have to believe. You can yeah. listen to everybody. And if you want to be an atheist when you grow up, fine. If you want to be a Christian, that's fine. But kind of like with the body autonomy, you know, you can decide who's going to give you a hug. And if you don't want to hug, mm -hmm. it's your space. Same thing with yeah. your mind. You can decide who's going to, you know, what you want to believe. But I, I know we've kind of, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, that's a, that's a really good thing to say is that you really need to teach kids how to protect their mind because their minds that are at a very vulnerable stage when they're young, they're very impressionable you are shaping their worldview. I mean, I, no pressure or anything, of course, but kids, you know, like my kids, they don't, they see the world through my eyes. I, you know, they don't know anything else, but what I show them because they're too young to go out on their own and get to know the world and themselves firsthand. So they know secondhand what the world is like for me. And I'm trying my best not to work the view of actual reality. Um, like you were saying, all these stories, mythologies upon mythologies upon mythologies. I was last night, I was actually thinking, it was, I was unpacking and I knit and crochet, so I have a lot of balls of yarn. I was thinking like, if you took a ball of yarn and every time you found a story that, you know, was 
imposed from another story or written from another story. You just pulled this yarn and eventually you're left with nothing and you realize that it was a complete fabrication to begin with. Like if you go back and there's just stories upon stories and layers and layers that you pull back, eventually you're going to get to nothing because it's not real. It's fabricated. So, you know, a long time ago when these real or when these mythologies came to be, we use gods and goddesses to describe natural phenomenon that we had no idea what actually was. Like if you were outside and you saw a bolt of lightning come down, that must be a god of lightning. You know, and I don't know what the god of lightning is, but if you hear thunder, oh, that's Thor and his hammer, I think, is the god of thunder. You know, and then you use that to describe natural phenomenon. And then you come up with all of these stories because, you know, people didn't have the internet back then. So you just sat around and told stories at night. So, you know, you start giving these characters stories, you know, you give Thor a personality and stories. And then, you know, if heaven forbid someone should be struck by lightning, oh, you better pray to Thor and, you know, hope that he hears you and, you, I don't know who the god of lightning is. Uh, Zeus. Thor, and I don't know. Zeus. But yeah, so you you become scared of the, these gods that you have convinced yourself is real. And, you know, generations upon generations, you have all this, you know, you eventually have a religion. And, you know, thousands of years later, oh, hey, we can convince people that there's this god and control people um, through this so-called religion. Yeah. You know, that's, Pretty much what the Roman Empire did, right? What Constantine did when he brought the Bible together and took out all the stories that he didn't like, he used that as a means to control people. Yeah, and it's funny you should say that because the uh, the God of Thunder is actually indirectly woven in where in, in Jesus is walking with his disciples and two of them are, at least two of them are, are twins. I know there's there's evidence that Jesus was a twin too, but um, there were the Jesus character was a twin described as twin. But there's other twins that are disciples, and they're called sons of thunder. They're literally called no, sons no, no, of thunder. No. It's like that's it's Castor and Pollux. Like I'm sorry, but that's it's really <laughs> not that hard. And it's 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 amazing to me the the things that there, there's a lot of stuff that takes a lot of work to decipher, but a yeah. lot of it is not that difficult. Um, you know, when you look at like Plato, Plato wrote. The, his, his um, work on Timaeus, you know, who, who is the blind man that Jesus heals? He's called the son of Timaeus. Um, you know, the, wow. the Bacchae, the, you know, the, the singular is Bacchaeus. You know, what, what do they call the man? And, and then the, in the Bacchae, they have this, this story, this man that goes up in a tree. So, you know, mm -hmm. who's watching the, the, the Bacchae. Um, and mm -hmm. when, when you get to the Zacchaeus story, you know, he goes up in a tree. It's Bacchus, Zacchaeus. They're 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 not even making it that hard to find. It just they're leaving all these yeah. clues. It's like that it's a mystery. People are afraid to ask, and they're yeah. afraid to look at mythology, so they don't know. It's right in front of their face, but they don't know. Yeah, exactly. And I think too, just the idea of adding to that, the idea that there's a lot more in terms of the content that was created at that time, telling people mm -hmm. there, there were 40 or 50 gospels at least. There yeah. were six different books of Acts. There's endless epistles. Um, there, there's so many forgeries and counter forgeries and you know, very good evidence that they're in the actual Protestant canon. You know, that, yeah. that some of these were added much later and that, you know, they're just written in the name of Paul, but they're not by Paul. Yeah, and this actually um, ties in with, with the continuation of my story, yeah, um, if it. you want to get back to that. Please. So after I graduated high school, I went to the Four Square Church. And um, after, you know, all of that, I really wondered, I knew that I couldn't be a Christian. I really wanted to know what the truth was. Like, what is, what am I? Why am I here? You know, the questions that everyone asks. Um, who am I? Why am I here? What is reality? Uh, what do we do with reality? What do we do with our time here? I wanted to know the truth, not what men had to say about the truth, because that's all that you really get in church is their interpretation of the truth. But what is the truth? No one really knows, right? So I wanted to know what the truth was. So I, you know, started looking in and studying different religions. And while they were very interesting, and I really gained a lot of perspective, that's all that they were, just other religions, just more of the same, just different wording. So, um, yeah, so I think that when I first started becoming a lot happier, when I got rid of the depression and everything, was when I finally felt that hell wasn't real. 
So that really ties in with the story with the mythologies and stuff. I was really into mythology and reading about it. And I was really interested in it. It was just so interesting to me. And I started reading about like the origins of hell and the origins of Satan. And um, I remember one night I was reading a book and it was a, a Wiccan book about um, pagan origins of, you know, pagans that really believe in like a Satan, like Christians believe in. Um, but you know, different sects of, of that believe in, in, um, in Satan, I guess. I don't know. I don't, but, um, I was reading about mythologies of Satan and how, um, we have like the figure that we refer to as Satan today in Christianity. And I, I just remember like reading all this and I just started laughing and I'm like, none of it's real. <laughs> it's not real. Like Satan hell is just not real and at that point when I studied enough mythology to convince myself or to see the truth I should say that hell and Satan isn't real I just started laughing and I was happy like for the first time like truly happy because I didn't have that fear of dying and going to hell anymore um hmm. so I while I really liked studying mythology I just didn't feel like it was um something that I wanted to dwell on um, because it, you know, I wanted to know, well, if that's not real, then what is real? Yeah. So, you know, I, I eventually, I already practiced like yoga and stuff like that. I actually, even though, you know, I wasn't allowed to, I practiced yoga from the time that I was 13 years old. Um, my mom had this hotel well workout video that it was yoga but they didn't use that term and I loved it it was so cool it's like this cheesy 80s workout video and I finally um, discovered you know that yoga and I did lots of stretches and stuff like that when I was little and when I got um, my own apartment you know I started reading more about it and I started meditating and I got pretty into like the more of the eastern philosophy i'm not saying religion because there's difference between religion and philosophy i definitely stay away from you know deities and stuff like that but so as far as like buddhism goes um the root of all human suffering is complete identification with your mind and with your ego so that's something that really kind of woke me up um so like if I ask you who are you you would tell me that you know I'm Tim Mills I'm the son of this person I have these kids I'm the husband of this person I have an awesome YouTube channel called the Harmonic Atheist I'm you work with the stock market right so yeah. you work with the stock market um you know that's interesting fact about you but who are you those hmm. are just facts about you so you know the the eastern philosophy teaches that you are not your ego which is what those are you're not in essence 10 mils you're that awareness behind your thinking and behind your thoughts hmm. which ultimately you know is that universal consciousness that's behind everyone so, you know, in Eastern philosophy, we're all part of that universal consciousness. Some call it God, some call it the universe, some call it just consciousness. Um, you know, and when you die, Tim Mills goes away. You know, your, Tim Mills doesn't exist anymore. But that energy that animates your body and that is that awareness behind Tim Mills, you know, still exists somewhere. We don't know where, but, mm. you know, and that really to have that separation between my me and my story and all the trauma that it created and to have that to be able to like separate myself from that and step into that awareness to where I can just be an observer of those thoughts and to see from an objective viewpoint how those thoughts and patterns and stories affected me just that gave me that peace that passes passes all understanding because you cannot understand it you have to feel it so hmm. you know you can't understand peace through your mind you have to feel that peace you have to go above your mind 
and step into that awareness and observe, you know, if you don't get tangled up in it because that's ultimately, you know, when you die, that story's gone. Hmm. And I, I, I hope that this makes sense and that you don't think that I'm insane, but that really helped me so much. And I felt exactly how these Christians told me I would feel after getting saved. Hmm. I felt so happy and so peaceful and you know this was a process of a few years of course um but you know i was happy and i still am of course but that was you know a long time ago that i went through that and i very am still very happy i don't feel like i have any like you know i i have anxiety and slight depression due to other issues in my life but when it comes to religion i don't at all anymore mm. like it's, it's gone it's, that's awesome yeah. i would say ditto <laughs> ditto to that I, I felt more um i felt more freedom and peace and joy in the first uh hour and day and week than i did in my entire 43 years as a christian wow um, yeah i mean combined and i think part of it too is just realizing like you're talking about the idea of like you had to get rid of some ideas first, you know, hell and Satan and mm -hmm. all that that comes with it. Yeah. Um, but once you got rid of the bad ideas, you you now had a platform to ex to explore what well, what's left, like what reality, what is reality, what should I be yeah. doing with my life? And it was very similar for me, and it, it felt almost like this weird paradox of like if you could imagine that that you know you know in, the, in I think it's Philippians it talks about how. Paul talks about the the things that were were my in my positives column. You know, I was a Pharisee, I was a Jew, I was this, I was that, um, I was a tribe of Benjamin. These were all positives to me before Christ, but now now I'm a, now that I'm a Christian, I actually see them as like negatives because they kept me from seeing my need. I was so proud of my heritage, but now that I'm in Christ, uh, they're they're all kind of then lost. They went from the positive column to the lost column because I they kept me from Christ, and in a very similar dynamic. It was like all this, all this stuff that I had, this background as a Christian, this, this, I mean, to me, I, I, I would say that there was some sense, not necessarily of, of peace, but just a sense of, I think I'm on the right track here. I'm pursuing God, Christ, and I know I'm certainly on fire for changing the world. I want to share the gospel. And it was all these positive things. And then suddenly, once I wake up and it feels like you literally are like waking up, like someone's yeah. getting you out of the, out of the matrix, you realize, oh, wow all this Christianity, this now goes in the, in the negative column. This was, this was a, a hindrance. And mm -hmm. it, it's almost like if you were to look at it like a balance sheet or like a graph of like your, your debt, let's say you, you owed, you know, you know, $10 billion, something that none of us would ever be able to afford to, to pay off, you know, on a regular salary, yeah. you owe $10 billion. And so if this is a zero, you're way, way, way down here somewhere. And sudden, and if this is, you know, Christianity, how, how far it keeps you from seeing reality when yeah. you, when you deconvert, all that's happening is you just got back to zero. Yeah. You didn't say, I believe in something different. You didn't say I've now got all the answers. All you said is everything that kept me from living my life, from being able to open my eyes is now gone. Yeah. I'm just back to zero, but at least I've got a chance. All my friends, my family, they all are stuck in this. And I felt like I just won the lottery because I at least have a chance to live my life. My, the, you know, the scales fell from my eyes, so to speak again, to quote mm -hmm. Max. And it's like, you, you just feel so alive. You're like I have a yeah. chance. And especially to, 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 to me to realize you, you realize very quickly when you deconvert, how weird Christianity is not just the bad stuff. Yeah. like hell. It's like, why would God need blood? And why does God want the end of little boy's penises cut off? You're like, this is so weird. And then you yeah. think suddenly all the weird stuff is just gone. It's instantly yeah. gone and you, you feel like the weight is lifted and you know, the, 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 the ability to just see the stars at night and think, I don't have any concept of this. There's Yahweh or Jesus involved in those stars at all. And there's yeah. no heaven or hell beyond the stars. There's no angels and demons fighting up there. They're just stars it's like yeah. end of story. And it's, it is so freeing. It is so freeing. Yeah. You can just step back and see the beauty in everything instead of like this underlying story that you've been telling yourself, like with the angels and demons, there's no angels and demons up there. You can just appreciate it for what it really is. And in one of my um, books that I've read, which I really picked up on and liked, 
um, you realize that humans are what have put these labels on everything. Like if you look at a tree, it's not a tree. That's just a label that we've put on it to understand something that we don't really understand. If you just sit with it and let it be, then it, you can kind of even feel that connection between you and everything else. If you just sit, like if you go out into nature and you just sit under a tree and you let go of all the labels and everything and just step back and observe everything from more of an objective viewpoint, then you just see beauty in absolutely everything. And you really appreciate nature and the world for what it is. And you don't have that constant worry about, you know, dying and going to hell or witnessing to people or whatever. And you can just be alive. You're free to be. That's all that you have to worry. You don't have to worry about anything to see <laughs> you know you don't have that constant cycle of stories in your mind that yeah. you've gotten tangled up in you let yeah. go of that and just stay present and focused and that's all that really life is about i guess i mean yeah and then you do have the freedom if you if you want to go back to the old stories to to look at them with fresh eyes and i know for some people yeah they're like, no, I've spent way more than enough time in the Bible. I don't need to go back to it for any reason. And that's totally cool. But for some of us that feel like our backgrounds and and gifts and, you know, talents, whatever, they, they lend to helping other people escape, which I certainly do. I, I've, I'm in the Bible more than I've ever been. But, you know, when you go back to it, if you do go back to it, you get to look at it with fresh eyes and pull it apart and kind of deconstruct it. You know, I mean, we do a lot of deconstructing before deconversion, but you get to keep deconstructing it and say, I'm really curious, like this was like Stockholm syndrome. Why did yeah. I love my persecutor? Why did I love this, this psycho God? I was absolutely enthralled. I sang songs to this guy that wasn't real, but if he had been real, he'd be a psychotic personality. And I loved him and I loved that I loved him. Like yeah. what was, what was this Stockholm syndrome? And to be able to pull apart the pieces of that onion and then to really be able to dive into well, what, what was Christianity? Where did it start? What is it mm. all about? How did it evolve? And it's 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 been really rewarding to me to be able to start to just to really dive into that. And I, I, I have a passion to hopefully do more and more of it to put yeah. things on the table. It's I, I describe it a lot as like it's a table where if Christians want to tell people you need to believe in this stuff, don't tell them 5% or 3%. Yeah. Tell them 100%. Tell them where it came from. And yeah. uh, it's just it, it really bothers me that they try to get people to sign up, so to speak, for this worldview with almost no information. They, they think, oh, we're telling you so much. You can go to Bible yeah. college, just dive into Greek and Hebrew. And, and when you look at what you need to know, it's at best three to 5%. It just, yeah. there's so much they don't yeah. tell people. I mean, even if you go to Bible college, you're still left with this mountain of information that you've never even heard of. I mean, my cousin actually, um, who I love so much, um, wanted to be, um, how do you pronounce it, an apologist? Mm -hmm. So he actually was working on his PhD, um, another story. So he, his passion was to be a pastor and to be a minister, or specifically a youth minister. So he went to school for that. And he was in New Orleans working on his PhD. And his wife had an affair with his best friend and divorced him. He got kicked out of Bible college because he was divorced. And they do not tolerate divorced people. Mm. So his wife cheated on him, divorced him. He got kicked out of school for it. <laughs> like, blows my mind. So mm. he worked at a pizza place after that. I mean, he was that close for getting his PhD in something. And now I think he's like a 911 dispatcher or something. Um, but yeah, like we, one of our favorite things to do when we get together is discuss theology because he's a very intelligent person and he's not, you know, one of the mindless people that's just like regurgitating all this information that he's been given, but he's actually very intelligent, very gifted. Um, so when we get together, we like to like have drinks and discuss theology <laughs> as one does. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like I even see like this, this mountain of misinformation that he's been given to, you know, go through life on. Like he's, he doesn't even, I don't even think that they teach 
mythology and stuff at like Bible college. Like, you know, this is where the origins of the Jesus story came from. This is, you know, the origins of the virgin birth. You know, they don't teach you that part. They just teach you the, the stuff from the Bible and that's it. And he, you know, is pretty unaware of, of everything else. And it's interesting to talk to him because, you know, he's a very intelligent person that he's using all this circular reasoning and he doesn't think outside the box, I guess. Yeah. It's, so. it's a very much a case study for all. I mean, I was, I did it too. I was in Bible college to be a minister and it's a real clear case study and how the effectiveness of brainwashing for, especially from an early age and of yeah. mixing it with sheltering where you don't get the information and, the idea of not just was there anything else that we needed to know, but just even the biggest, biggest question, like, is there even a fraction of a chance that we're wrong on this? Mm, yeah. Like no one ever entertains it. No one ever says no. we're, we're 99.9% .9 sure that Jesus is God and the Bible's from God, but you know, there's a 0.01% chance that maybe we're wrong. Like yeah. that isn't, you know, that's obviously that's 100% truth. Yeah. That's just crazy talk to even think about it. Yeah. Um, but the idea of entertaining, we might be wrong. We might be yeah. not just a little wrong, but utterly wrong. Yeah. Getting that out there is so critical. Um, yeah. We've talked a lot about deconversion here. I wanted to ask maybe to wrap us up about one of the most important topics for a lot of people is, is healing. It sounds like mm -hmm. some of the worst parts of some of certain people's stories didn't necessarily hit you and didn't hit me necessarily either. But a lot of people struggle with either anger of, wow, I, I wasted a lot of time talking yeah. to a guy who doesn't exist, you know, praise singing songs, you know, in a, in a congregation of people that are brainwashed. Um, I had a lot of time in it and then I had to take a lot of time to undo it. And now I've got mm -hmm. to take some time to, to heal from it. But that's yeah. maybe the most important part is just getting grounded again. Mm -hmm. If you have any insights from your experience or just anything, if you, from your conversation with other people, how do people begin to, once they're out, once they realize, yeah, this is the, the conversations, so to speak, with apologists are over. I don't need mm -hmm. to, I don't need to keep digging. I might because it's because it's a hobby, but the the conversation is over. That door has been shut. I'm I'm not trying to figure out if Christ is real, if the Bible's from God. That that conversation is utterly over in every way, shape, and form. But I still have to think about how do I, how do I get, find myself again? Um, yeah. And you kind of alluded to some of this, but specifically not, not necessarily finding yourself, but really the healing part of it where you learn to, you know, to be even more forgiving than the Christians are to, to forgive them for what they did to you. Even though they, as you said before, they, they were doing their best. Perhaps I think the apologists yeah. and pastors are probably more culpable, but you know, mm -hmm. the, the parents that just, they just want their kids to know the love of Jesus, but yeah. to forgive people, to be more gracious and then to to really get over some of the harder parts like you mentioned getting over hell but for some yeah. people they admit they 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 can say i know hell's not real but i still sometimes have nightmares about it yeah. or or maybe they were like uh, maybe they were one of those people that, that messed up sexually in in high school or something and they had this scarlet letter over them and now mm -hmm. they're free of it. And like, there was a no, no, that was not a big deal. So I explored my sexuality. That is not a problem. That's part of humanness. But they had people that ostracized them for years over it. And now they're out. And it's like, how do I just not hit the reset button? I've already hit it. I, I know, I know that God is not real, but how do I heal? Like, how do I become, how do I thrive mm -hmm. again? And, and now that I know that the world is so much brighter than this darkness yeah. of Christianity, how do I apply personally that to me and take away the dark clouds that weren't about Christianity's dark clouds, but just my personal story's dark clouds? Yeah. So, you know, I think that I've mentioned before, separating yourself from your story is a really big thing to do. Um, so how you heal? I mean, that's really the question, right? So, you know, a lot of times when you deconvert initially, you find yourself completely and utterly alone and you don't have anyone to turn to and you don't have anyone to talk to. Your parents aren't with you anymore because you deconverted. Some parents even go as far as disowning their kids because of deconversion. Um, you know, a lot of people have their whole lives caught up in, in the church. So when they step away, they're alone. 
and they feel very alone. So use that as an opportunity to get to know yourself. Maybe it's a good thing that you don't have like an outside teacher or something because who knows what they're going to teach you if that's even real or not. So I think that the best thing that you can do for yourself is to get to know yourself. If you don't have that fear of going to hell anymore, preventing you from, you know, like, I mean, I'm not going to say if you don't have the fear because some people really understand and know that hell is not real, but they have these lingering, lasting residual effects, uh, which it does heal over time if you work on it. Um, Get to know yourself turn inward because no one can tell you what you should believe in, but yourself. Find out what resonates with you and what doesn't resonate with you. Take certain things that you used to believe in and just sit with it. Get grounded in yourself and just sit with it and think, does this resonate with me? Is this real? Do I view the world like this? Or is this how people are telling me to view the world? You know, is this my view or is this their view? Separate it. Make a list. Say, this is how I've been told to to view the world and write down right next to it. But this is how I actually view the world. I've had to do that, too. Um, And that's helped tremendously. It's separating those stories and the feelings behind those stories. Make a column. This is what they told me to believe in, but this is what I believe in. And even then, even when you have your, but this is what I believe in list, sit with that. Does this feel right for me? Is this my truth? Or is this someone else's telling, or is this someone else telling me this is means to control me? You know, is this, so turn inward and get to know yourself and how you view the world. And it's probably a good thing that, you know, I'm not saying that it's a good thing that you're alone, but you'll eventually attract like-minded people. Just, um, you know, if you want to be around for, for me being around like-minded people, like in the yoga community or the Eastern, you know, viewpoint, um, community, I would go to yoga class. I would meet people. I mean, my goodness, I became a massage therapist and that was all that I was around. Immerse yourself in places and situations, you know, that people like-minded people are put yourself out there and you'll definitely make friends and and build yourself a support community. Um, Look on Facebook. There's a lot of Facebook groups out there. If you're looking for someone um, that can act as a support system, if you're interested in, you know, more, I just use, you know, Eastern stuff because that's what I kind of gravitated towards. So if you want to learn more about Buddhism or yoga or something, um, Put yourself in these groups and and kind of immerse yourself in it. And, you know, even then, definitely discriminate whether this is, you know, how I feel or or they telling me I should feel like this. So Mm -hmm. use yourself as a compass. Uh, And, you know, you'll never lead yourself in the wrong direction if you truly listen to what your mind is telling you or what your, you know, your consciousness is telling you. That is definitely your your North Star and your, your compass is yourself. And as you kind of break away from the me and my story mindset, because that's all it is. It's a story. The past is in the past. The future is in the future. We're in the present right now. That's all that we have. That's all that we've ever had. When we were in the past, you know, it was the present moment for us at one point, but now it's not in the future you know, we'll experience the future as the present moment. The present moment is all that we have. So if you just focus on the present moment and how can I make this, you know, the best day, the best present moment ever, you know, you don't have to live in your mind and you're not completely identified with that me and my story. You don't have that negative story hovering over in your mind, clouding your vision. You can just experience life as how it's meant to be experienced without that cloud in front of your eyes. Um, I mean, you can be happy. You can be ecstatically happy if you just let go of, I know it's not so simple in practice. You know, I went through it too. It took me years to separate me and my story. But 
you'll eventually get there if you keep at it and, you know, don't give up. And meditation really helps me quite a bit because you sit and you, you view your thoughts and stuff and you start to notice different patterns in your thinking. And, you know, are you telling, what are you thinking about? What you think about shapes your reality. So if you focus on me and my story, you will suffer. You know, if you focus on being happy, you will be happy. And this is over a period of time. Like I said before, there's no overnight fixes. Um, mm. But the trauma that, you know, we went through definitely kind of fades away. And you look at it with a higher perspective than what you did before. So even if you went through a lot of trauma, you know, it's still there. It's part of you, you know, until you die. Of course it is. But that's what shapes you. But you can view it from a higher perspective and get more, you know, an objective viewpoint on it. And you're not so identified with it. And that's the thing is identification um, and just getting that higher perspective of your story. And yes, this is what happened to me. How can I use it for the best possible way? How can I use it to help myself? How can I use it to help others? A lot of people don't have that. Like, for example, I can't help but think, like, if I grew up in more of a contemporary Christian house and it was fun, you know, and I got to go to, like, DC talks, concerts and, and stuff, I probably would have liked it a lot and I would probably still be a Christian. And that horrifies me. <laughs> so, you know, growing up with the independent Baptist really made me want to get out of it and it really wanted me to find out the truth and now I'm so happy so much more happy than I could have been if I had a you know wonderful childhood I'm not saying you know that trauma is a good thing because it absolutely is not but use it for your highest good mm. you can you can harness that energy and use it for your highest good and you can use it to help others and that's something that comes with practice and repetition over time but be patient with yourself. You're not going to have an overnight fix. You're not going to wake up the next morning and be like, you know, you're, you know, completely healed and, and happy. You know, that happens, but it's incredibly rare and it's probably not realistic, but it just takes time and repetition. Repetition over time will eventually, you know, if you try hard enough, you will get there. You'll get there. It's, you got to be patient with yourself and you have time before you know, when you were caught up in the rapture story and going to hell, you didn't have time. That was that sense of urgency. You have to get right, right now. You have to get right with God. You have to get right with God right now, but you don't. So you have that free will to step back and be patient with yourself because you have that time now that you didn't have before. And if you just give yourself time and be patient with yourself and, you know, you can meditate, you can do whatever you want. Just get to know yourself you will eventually heal and mm. be happy. Maybe not fully, maybe not in this lifetime, but you know, you'll definitely be headed in the right direction with yourself. And, and that's mm. where it's at. <laughs> I love to, but part of the side effect of some of those ideas is that you really do get your power back. I think you mentioned that at one point, but you know, whether yeah. you're feel like, you know, if it's one of the issues that we talked about earlier where, you know, women feel inferior to men, you know, the men are the leaders, the men hear from God, the women don't, or yeah. um, you're, you're empowered because you're, you know, maybe you wanted to be more sexual in your life and you felt like you couldn't, and now you feel like you can, whatever it is, just, the, or even just the very generic power empowerment to say, I get to pick what I want to believe or don't believe yeah. if, and, and I, I don't have to fear anybody else's threatening um, or ostracization, even though certainly we could be shunned in life. But, you know, the worst that they can do to me is is shun me. And yeah. uh, certainly there's there's countries in the world where it, it can get worse, and I acknowledge that. But, you know, right. for, for a lot of us, we can choose the hard path to just say, I'm walking away from mythology as a worldview. And yeah. and I appreciate that, you know, that our world is evolving to the point where a lot, a lot more people can make that choice. Yeah. But just whatever it is, if whether it's very specific or very general, just this idea of I have the power, no one yeah. else, I don't have to inherit a worldview. Uh, I don't have to believe it just because people tell me I have to. And if I, if I don't believe with like them, they're going to look down on me. 
yes, you're, you might be biting off more than you can chew with if you don't develop some thick skin. Like you need to realize people are going to fight back. Um, you, you would think Christians would reach out to and say, well, now that you've left, clearly you need to be saved because you're clearly not a Christian. So let me show you more love in the gospel. Instead, they're going to treat you as a traitor. Um, yeah. And they're going to they're going to be very, very mean and snarky to you. But whatever that pushback is like, and it's it's sad that it happens, but it still is so freeing and, and to know that you yeah. have the power. No one else is dictating to you. No one else is saying yeah. you have to be this person. You have to believe this system, this worldview. I love it because yeah. I, f I feel so sad for people either feel like they, they can't take that power or maybe what's just as bad, if not worse, they don't know. Like, yeah. They don't know that it's there. Yeah. They feel like it's not even like an option. It's, it's not like yeah. I could take the power, but I'm choosing not to because I'm afraid. It's like, I don't yeah. even know that I could. It's not, a, not an option. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, I really appreciate um, your, your sharing your story. Was there any, I know I asked you a lot of questions, but was there any other questions you were hoping to get to before we wrap up that I didn't ask? Um, I don't think so. Um, nothing quick anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do have another couple of stories, but they would take a long time. So probably not. Um, maybe we can do a follow-up or something later on. Yeah, um, that'd be yeah awesome. I think that was, that was pretty much everything that I wanted to cover today. Cool. Well, I we, we appreciate so much, uh, Tara, your story. This has been awesome. You are a great public speaker. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> and you, you're very, very good at that. So definitely looking forward to seeing what you do with your platform over Thank time. You. And I hope, hope it gets, you know, to be very, very influential. You're a great public speaker and your story is, is amazing. And I appreciate your vulnerability to share all the details. That's a, that's a quite a journey you've been through. Um, and I'm, I'm, we've talked about, it. I'm so glad you got out. I'm really glad you got yeah. out. So. It's thank awesome. you so much. Thank yeah. you. Well, everyone, we've been speaking with Tara Banks. Uh, Tara, thank you again so much. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Tim. Thank you.